Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So this session is um, managing and protecting the live content flow. As you've seen from your, um, uh, from the session list, we're kind of walking through different parts of the live production, live content workflow process. My name's Tim Siglin. I've uh, been a contributing editor for Stream Media Magazine for about 17 years now. I wrote the decade of streaming media about seven and a half years ago. So. Looking forward to coming up on the 20 year mark with streaming. Um, I've got four panelists with me and I'd like each of them to go ahead and just briefly introduce themselves starting right here on my left. Hi, I'm Casey Charvet. I'm the director of technology at Tour Gigs and we live stream concerts. I'm Derek Gebler, CEO and founder of Field 59. It's an online video platform for broadcasters and live events. I'm Joe Einstein, uh, live architect for Verizon Go 90. I'm D. Cooper, CIO with uh, Mirror Image, and run App Dev at Right Brain Media. Oh, very nice. Okay, so we're going to start with a quick video, um, and if you want to sort of set us up to what we're going to see here. Sure. So I think in the idea of uh, protecting the live content workflow, what we've got here is a a, a screen cap of. Uh, we were doing a live event. Uh, it was a pay-per-view concert, as are most of our broadcasts, and. One particular user had taken it upon himself to uh, screen cap this <coughs> off of his TV with a phone or tablet of some sort and then restream it for free to a uh, live streaming service that I've uh, blurred out to. Okay. I, don't, I don't mean to implicate them in this. Uh, it wasn't anything it of wasn't their doing. It wasn't their fault. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so we, we discovered this bozo. And, uh, and we did what we do when we discover people violating our AUP like this, and we shut them down. Okay, so we're gonna play this real yeah. quick. So this is our uh, admin console that just popped up here where uh, an engineer is, has issued the command to kill, and it'll take a few seconds to propagate through the system. And, uh, So suddenly his content, he, yeah. he no longer has access. To and, then, and then you actually see him get up and try to fix it here, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have something that just says busted on the, the TV screen? <laughs> 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 nice. nice. <laughs> So, so we actually get, got. So let's get another code. So they, yeah. they bought it again. So uh, we, I guess we got two sales out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you, before we start with the other questions, how did you track what he was just doing? Was uh, it a human it, interaction? Yeah, in this case, we, we found him out. Uh, these people typically don't. They, they sort of want to be internet heroes, so they advertise the fact that they're doing it. And it's pretty easy to find. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then being able to trace back to the particular person that's doing it based on their screen that, name? That is, uh, that's sort of in our platform, and I can't really okay. go into a All lot right. of details that's on that, unfortunately. Magic happens. Yeah, yeah. it's secret sauce out. on that. Okay. And how frequently do you get two sales out of something like that versus somebody just giving up? You know, um, Every step that we engineer into our, our platform, be it policy enforcement, which you just saw there, or um, at, at every level, is all sort of with the idea of driving sales. We, we don't want to, I mean, we want them to know that we're not happy with what they did, but we also don't want to um, miss out on a sale. So that's a very egregious example okay, of sure. policy violation. There's sort of lesser degrees, but all of which we try to funnel into sales uh, and that's so. In other words, you shouldn't have done it, but if you want to buy it again, we're happy to. Have yeah, to do it. exactly. And Oops. and you know, we, we can sort of try to tweak that UI UX moving forward. Sure. Um, but you know, it's always with the goal of bringing in sales. Okay, very good. So I'm going to start at the opposite end of the table. Um, and I had a series of questions that I prepared, and then we're going to have Q and A from the audience, of course. So um, we're talking both here about management and protecting. So I want to talk about management first. What, um, what are some of the live stream management challenges that you sense are your customers' highest pain points? It's live. Uh, okay. Anything that could go wrong will go wrong. Um, the sheer cost to ensure that it's going to go right is redundancy. So some of the large scale clients we work with will have three 
backups. You know, so we, they're paying for the encoders, the equipment, connectivity, and multiple CDNs that they might not even use. They just keep warmed up and ready. Um, and what kind of client would, would that be? The IBM Masters event. Okay. So we've done that the last few years, and uh, every year it's got its new challenges. There's mm -hmm. always something that could go wrong, even with as much of an investment that's there, there's always something that can come up. And uh, so that's probably the biggest pain point. So how much redundancy is too much redundancy? Because you know, you're talking and What's it worth? Three. Well, that's true, <laughs> that's true. You know, that's really what it comes down to is, is the value of the event. You know, if it's a free event and it's paid for by ads, you need views. Sure. If it's a pay-per-view event, people might be willing to wait. So redundancy might not have a big play. Um, really, it's going to be gauged by the content, what you're putting out there. That's going to control the redundancy level that you're going to put in place. So just out of curiosity, and anybody else on the panel can answer, answer this as well, is there a rule of thumb in terms of redundancy that if the budget is X, you spend 3% on redundancy, 5% on redundancy, um, or is that is there not really a model? I don't have that kind of formula. I mean, I, you know, in my previous life, coming out of the service provider model, um, you know, things with like Grammys and Academy Awards where it you know, really can't fail because you're sort of mirroring a broadcast. Um, you know, we would typically present, you know, you can be diverse out of the venue multiple ways, and you can even have diverse encode sites and then multiple CDNs. So it, I don't know that there was necessarily a it's X percent more. Um, it really came down to, you know, how much do you want to spend? And how redundant? Thinking yeah. it can't possibly fail three right. times. Okay. You know, like Oscars is one where it, you know, we really we sort of did everything that you could possibly do, and there were backups to the backups to the backups. And I think then the, the hard part is, you know, at what point are you building in so much redundancy that when something does go wrong, can you actually recover from right. you know something spiraling mm -hmm. out of control that you didn't think about? Which, and I've seen that happen, and it's, um, and so it's almost having a you know pull the ripcord to get out of all your recovery mm -hmm. scenarios. Mm -hmm. So what about for you? What are some of the management pain points that customers have? Um, again, back to my previous world, I think it was, um, you know, sometimes it was, uh, I mean, the worst that we saw was website crashing. Everything on the back end, the video side is perfectly fine. <laughs> website wasn't cached properly on the CDN and, and went down after mm -hmm. 5,000 users. Authentication, is that? Um, most of the stuff we were doing wasn't authentication. Okay. It would be database issues. It would be something really simple that they just didn't think about. Like a calendar or schedule that's yeah. got some hideous got join in it that Right, and that ninety percent of the year the they database. have zero traffic on their site except for that one day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nice. What about you? Well, I would say it's uh, sometimes maybe it's not redundancy, but how many humans are paying attention to the event? You know, if they're going to have a large event, how many people are you going to have that are monitoring the event? You know, these things, some things, some of our customers, they're, they're streaming all day long, and so it's assumed that you know, certain redundancy, this can work automatically, but for a high scale, high event, you need to have a lot of people looking at it, and not just on the technical side, but you know, what are you doing monitoring the different streams? Are you monitoring social media? We found somebody doing the same restreaming thing, and mm -hmm. we were just, you know, looking at a hashtag for one of the events we were streaming. And sure enough, there's a restreamer, and I think it was a new stream, and we just shut them down. And yeah. it's not not that hard to do, but you have to have real people looking for that. Yeah. That's not. I suppose you could automate that, but what you're paying for is that there's there's real people uh, taking care of this. Interesting. So it, it's not just people monitoring the technical aspects of it, it's monitoring the monetization aspects and the mm -hmm. social aspects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then from your standpoint. I think uh, I'll echo what you said about um, uh, origination and, and sort of path diversity and that uh, the contribution side, uh, connectivity is always something that I worry a lot about. I mean, that's sort of my job, but when we do a multi-camera shoot, we're talking 10 plus cameras. If we lose a camera, it kind of sucks, but it's not the end of the world. We've got nine other cameras that are working fine on the switch. Um, if we have one path out of the venue because that's all we've got, um, you know, I, I really don't like those scenarios because that's an obvious failure mode that we just have to kind of like sacrifice a chicken and hope doesn't happen. Um, but that's on the client side. On the end user side, um, man, the. The, the, the people, when, when we have a stream that we know is working right and everything's clicking, and then you just have, I, I say 1% is our average, 
uh, number of users that just can't get it to work. And that's because they're using uh, you know, Internet Explorer 5 or something, and they've got spyware tools out the wazoo uh, and toolbars and all that. And you're just like, man, I, you know, I, we'll try to help you as much as we can. Um, but at, at a certain point, you just have to kind of say, well, we'll give you your money back because it's not going to work for you. Uh, but we, we figure about 1% of users will kind of fit into that critical trouble ticket scenario. So we try to staff up um, ahead of time based on ticket sales uh, on that 1% number. So if there's 1,000 ticket sales, we expect 10 people to sort of have those major issues. And it's, they're going to manifest within the first five minutes of the show. So we try to get those addressed and out of the queue as quick as possible. Interesting. So let's switch a little bit to security and authentication. What are the types of content for each of you that are most likely to be secured um, or, and or authenticated, and why? Um, and I'm not just thinking about media and entertainment. I'm thinking about even content from uh, universities, lectures, and that kind of thing. But just, and we can start with you and work, work our way back. But what kind of content typically does your typical customer see that they want to have secured? And of course, you're out doing um, tours, so the right. assumption and, is it's a pretty easy yeah, answer for Yeah, and we, we, have, we have other clients as well that use the platform, um, and they each have their own tolerance. But I'll, I'll stick with the tour gigs concerts as sort of the, mm -hmm. the model example. And yeah, we absolutely have to secure these. They're pay streams, and anything that causes a loss in sales is uh, something that's not really acceptable. Um, but we have to manage this more from a policy standpoint, and DRM, traditional DRM, doesn't really help us out in this. I mean, there's, as you see, somebody can just point their phone at a screen, and, and there's no DRM that I know of that will prevent that. Um, so uh, yeah, so authentication, so we've built sort of our own platform, and authentication is something that is expected for every stream. Okay. The technology is there. So the, the customers that we work with are mostly broadcasters. We mm -hmm. do some. Um, higher profile um, training and educational events. So um, private corporate events is always behind some sort of DRM or some sort of um, a login credentialed uh, type thing. So that Inclu type of thing. Including for the mobile road warrior who's out there within the corporation? It's, <laughs> it's for it, it, that type of corporate um, training. Uh, they want to know who's logging in, too. Okay. They want to track that. Really? They want to know who's watching their presentations. And so we have features built out to know Joe down in accounting made sure that he watched the stream when he was supposed to. Um, they want to have that analytical tracking, and they want to be able to track um, if there was any question and answers through the chat ses sessions. Most of the broadcasters, um, it's going to be premium sports. Um, we've been asked to geo-block certain things that are not in the right areas. But for the most part, broad broadcasters, they're starting to come around on this. this you know, we've had this for a while, and it just isn't being used um, for being able to restrict on a particular broadcast area. And the, I think it's starting to be a hybrid where they're going to offer up a second stream that might be protected, and then their mainstream is still available for everybody. OK, got it. I'd say we've probably got a unique use case. We've got a you know, mobile product, 290 that's available to anybody in the US. Mm -hmm. um, Verizon customers obviously get you know, more content than, than other um, the carriers. So I think we have a, it was a login process and then we, we do some work on the back end to detect, you know, are you a customer? Do you get certain content? Do you mm -hmm. not? So it's the authentication piece more than the security piece? It's probably more authentication than, than security. Okay. I mean, we use secure everything um, and, you know, we've had all, you know, I think in, it, in my last 15 years, we've always had the screen scraping issue. It's been around. So yeah. uh, I think everybody has that issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it started with VCRs and it's moved on. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mobile phones. Yeah, and in the VCRs, at least to the technology, macrovision was something that could sort of block that from a copy standpoint, but there's nothing that can block the analog to analog. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, we first start asking why would they want to secure the content? I mean, mm. security is a kind of a questionable thing altogether. Mm -hmm. If they say that's where their money comes from, then they need to make sure that they've ensured uh, certain levels of measurement, right? On cable TV, you buy through cable TV. If on the internet, it will be restreamed. Geo-blocking is fluff, right? So just get a DNS from another location, you know, dnscodes.com. I mean, VPNs. So there is, if that's where their monetization is coming from, that would be my first question to them. Maybe they should look at pay up front or subscription. Netflix does well. 
Um, the content can be stolen, but it's really the people who produce the content that in that scenario probably care more about it, not necessarily the person who's putting it out there. Uh, so you know, we, we tend to try to find out why they need the content secured and what's their logic behind securing the content. We want it secured. I mean, why not put it on to stop the average everyday person? But any average hacker is going to. Anybody that's done a uh, YouTube stream where they play a video game, open up a website, I mean, it, that's open source software you get, and you just share your screen with anybody. Um, so it's not rocket science for anybody to do it. So we, we try to encourage the client to ensure that their profit model comes from either ads or some kind of other payment, something else. Uh, needs to be put in place. Securing is that nice thing that we tell people, but at the end of the day, it can't really be truly secured. Okay. Good. And in the in the live context, the the content for us loses a lot of value once it's not live. Anyway. Sure. So that sort of drives yeah. our goal on that. We're mainly concerned with stopping loss during the hours that the show is live. Do you find though? <clears throat> it's interesting to say that because in the corporate world, um, at least in the old days, they used to do the live event and they'd rebroadcast the event, um, say six hours later for somebody on a different time zone. Do you find yourself doing any of that if you have a, a tour that somebody wants to reach audiences that may not be within a particular geography or even a particular continent? Sure, the linear replay is a big thing of what we do and uh, we found that that helps user experience quite a bit. Um, and yeah, at that point, it's completely possible that somebody will have grabbed the screen and put it on a torrent site and done something with the content against our wishes um, while we're doing a rebroadcast. But again, that rebroadcast is sort of icing on the cake compared to the original live stream. From a monetization standpoint. Yeah, from a monetization okay. standpoint. Okay, that's good to know. All right, so we're going to shift quickly out to the audience and see if there are any questions at this point. Um, and I don't know if we have a microphone that goes around. Is there anybody who has a question so far as to what we've, what we've talked about? All right, so moving on. Um, yes. yes, oh, sorry. So the question is, are, have you looked at watermarking or anything that can uniquely identify? I'm assuming you're talking invisible watermarking as opposed to oh, fingerprinting? Well, yeah, invisible watermarking or even fingerprinting. Okay. So that's, that's a good question that each of you would like to hear an answer. We'll start at the end. Uh, I like what Crunchyroll does. I don't know if anybody watches anime, but my username gets injected into the stream, which is nice, because if I go and share it, I have to do some work to remove those segments from the, uh, or black it out. So whenever you see Crunchyroll videos that were stolen, one, you know they came from Crunchyroll because it's blacked out in the same spot. Um, but we've seen audio fingerprinting and things like that where they put sounds and certain things that we will not hear, but. Uh, I mean, it didn't really work for the music industry, record labels and everything. It's just once somebody can identify it, they watch for those things, it can be stripped. Um, it is a good preventative measure, but once again, I've not really seen a technique that's truly working in the industry. And at what level, and this is sort of an add-on question as each of you answer, <clears throat> at what level is the watermark so egregiously impacting the content itself that it's no longer worth having in terms of a visible watermark? I mean, it's, if you've watched Crunchyroll, they do a good job, you know, I and mean, it's infrequent, it's randomized and uh, done in a way that it, I barely even notice it unless I'm watching for it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I think from the physical watermark and the bug, I mean, I think what most of our clients, going, going back to my previous world, we just, you know, we put the Oscars bug or we put the ABC bug right. there. So, you, you do so at least when it does get out there, right. at least we're still somewhat promoting the brand. Um, we would typically do, um, we'd upload assets to YouTube for their content matching system, so at least it would pull things down. But then, you know, people are just flipping the image or they're putting it, you know, there's so many sites now, you really can't, that's even hard uh, these days. Okay. All right, I think it's mostly for YouTube where our customers are asking for that sort of thing because their content is valuable to them on their sites. Mm -hmm. And once it's taken over to YouTube, it's hard to get it back. So they at least want to have some proof to say, hey, it came from us. It's okay, okay if it's on YouTube, but you know, we were the ones that broke the story. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, we can fingerprint our content live on a targeted basis, so uh, event-driven basis, and we, we do that occasionally. 
uh, and when we upload things uh, and as we move to uh, a more VOD based, uh, as we begin to leverage our back catalog in a VOD and subscription manner, we'll begin to implement that because then the non-live content mm -hmm. does have a lot more value to us. Sure. Um, so yeah, yeah. but I, I think fingerprinting um, can be a, a pretty powerful thing and uh, in, in the context of a live event, you don't need it up there for more than a few seconds to, to identify somebody. So. Okay, good. Another question. You had an interesting discussion about redundancy, and I think there's a great recent example of how, no matter how redundant you are, you get caught. The World Series is a great example, where in the middle of the World Series broadcast, like in the fourth inning, blacks out, the production trucks lose power, and it comes down to a single point of failure. Not, and there's, I, it's almost like I don't think there's any real true level of redundancy that you can have that completely alleviates you or takes you and makes you immune from having an issue like that. So I guess the, well, the root of my question here and the direction I'm going is what I think that, at least with the example of the World Series, it took them like 45 minutes to recover. That's huge. You're talking about the World Series, like a game of the World Series. Well, in the, the Pacquiao Hollyfield fight, it took them 45 minutes to fix the authentication beforehand. It, exactly. So you, when you, the question isn't if it happens, it's when it, situations like that happen with each of your organizations. How do you, how do you counteract that? How do you respond? I think that's a huge, you know, do you have a process or a, uh, people that are involved with recovering from what it happens, recovering from the incident? And, and before you answer that about a process, because I think that's very important, I would say in the early days of the industry, and I'm talking late 90s, early 2000s, there was a running joke in the enterprise space, which was you used to hear nobody gets fired for buying IBM. Um, it was nobody gets fired for rolling a satellite truck for the CEO's all hands meeting, where if you tried it on an IP delivery and it failed, it's more likely you're going to be out the door. Yeah, exactly. so, so to your point, it's when it fails, what's the process and what do you do? So I actually, it's great. So let's start at the far end, kind of work from that standpoint. Yeah, we're constantly rewriting that guide. <laughs> um, the last event with Valve, we did a Dota stream and we got DDoSed. Right? So the biggest companies in the world, we got all these people, all these things in place, redundancy beyond imagine, and we still got DDoS, right? Because the bigger you are, the better a target. You, know? you want to make a show for people online and well, if you've got that many people, then if I DDoS your site in the middle of the event and all those people now know I did it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we just go through the standard process of here's our guide, here's the process, here's what we recommend based on what we know to date. And uh, you know, there are best case kind of measures that you put in place, uh, always CDN. Try to have your uh, site be flat, like HTML, so you can truly cache it, cache it across multiple CDNs if needed. Um, you know, those are the kind of steps that we take when we know there's going to be a high volume of users, just load balancing and things like that. But no, that book is still in progress. So first off on your World Series question, uh, it was fully redundant generators. Everything was redundant. Water while they were fueling the generators got into the tanks. Mm. So they did come down to a single point of failure. And, and if you look at any of the designs we've ever done, they all come down to a single point of failure. And there's a single one up here that didn't have some, you know, even on Oscars, it still came down to one AT&T fiber cable that leaves the campus for every single broadcaster. Um, that's, you know, that big. Um, so, you know, what we've always done is, is backhaul everything, get it to a secured location that's, you know, data center, and then at least you can, you know, at least Fox was able to cut to the studio. So they weren't sort of dead in the water. Um, and, you know, then they recovered by getting the international feed and routing that over and things like that. But, you know, I think that's the, sort of the best thing. So at least you can get to a slate and you can get to alternative content. So at least it doesn't look broken. Looking broken, I think, is always the worst, you know. <laughs> it's, we, we had an instance in the early days where we had an AB switch failover except the power supply on the failover failed. Right. right. So then, yeah, yeah you're it's well. like, it's still, it always comes down. So I think, you know, whether it's the website being the single point of failure or the, or, you know, something on site. Um, but yeah. And then even that, you've got your master control, that becomes your single point of failure. You know, in my AEG days, we still, we brought everything back to LA in a very hardened facility. That's still a single point of failure with the same, you know, one fuel tank. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say some of the production stuff, uh, we, we're not really too much into production, but yeah, on the production side, there's a ton of points of failures, and 
it's it's um, coordination is probably all I can say. Is just you've got to talk to talk to everybody and know who at least is running the thing that actually where all the different points of failure are. Because if you don't even know who it is, then you know, I, you're right though, from a streaming side of things, um, our technology is like, yeah, okay, well we've got a handbook and we've got a plan of attack if something went down, how do we switch over? And so I mean, I actually think maybe our jobs are even easier than the physical equipment side of things. So from just dealing with software and, and networks, networks maybe, but you know, that, you know, computer networks are meant to be super redundant already. And that's the whole point why you use them. But, I think it's if you're doing a live production, it's going to be everything, the feet on the floor, that's where it all really comes down to. And I kind of feel like I just kind of have to know that they're doing their job and it, you're never going to completely get 100% ever. Yeah, I can, uh, I mean, I've, we could probably swap failure mode stories all day up here. It's things, things will fail in ways that you don't even know or expect. We had, uh, we had our chat fail, and this caused a this triggered a, a, a browser lockup essentially because it ate the, it caused uh, the browser to consume a huge amount of CPU, and it was something in like the scroll bar. So somebody in the chat typed "woo" with a whole bunch of O's after it, <laughs> and it triggered something in the word wrap that we hadn't seen before, and then this was a JavaScript bug in a scroll bar library, and then the browser just locked up, and there was we were just like what. You know, the, the, and, and you know, the band manager's like, chats should be completely separate. It's like, it is separate. It's a whole different server. It's everything. It's just, it's a, a browser bug, you know, or a library that, that affects the browser. Um, so yeah, there's those kind of failure modes. I mean, we, we try to have as many um, egress paths as possible. I mean, w within budget constraints, we have to be in and out of a lot of different venues. And um, like, we, we roll KA band satellite a lot. Uh, we use... Uh, connectivity that might be available at the venue a lot. Um, we had a, you know, a drunk guy stumble into our KA band dish one night at a festival, and we're out in the middle of a field. There, we, there were no other connectivity options. I guess we could run two satellites uh, in case somebody stumbles into one dish and knocks it over. Um, so yeah, there's sort of these weird uh, things that can cause failure. I, I guess the other thing that we try to do is um, for as many parts of the pathway and the workflow, we try to, if we can't, if we're not doing it ourselves, for example, we don't have our own CDN, that's kind of, that'd be overkill, but um, I know who to call and I have an escalation contact list at the CDN itself or multiple CDNs, uh, and I'm not relying on some third party service that might have a four hour ticket turnaround because our event's gonna be over in four hours. So I can pick up the phone and I can call my CDN, I can call my cloud provider, um, I can, you know, we have our own data center operations and we have, um, you know, for events, we'll staff the, the engineers, which a lot of times is me. Um, but we, we control as many parts of the path as possible um, so that we can escalate things quickly if there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of key. If we just pass it all off to a, a turnkey service and, you know, they weren't up to the challenge, then there's really nothing we can do from that point. Right. I mean, you, you can't control everything. The, you mean... Uh, you represent a CDN, and there's all different parts of the pieces. There's just you. It's all about collaborating and coordinating. And yeah, there's unless you're a super huge, there's no way you're gonna. Maybe if you're Verizon, I guess you could control everything. We use Edge Pass. <laughs> <laughs> you could, but it, you know you have to at least know, like you're saying, who's that point of contact that you can call and yeah. make sure that they're ready and standing by. And I think we we typically on our even our medium medium to large events have a bridge open. And sometimes there's two or three bridges depending on the skill sets needed on that bridge for active communication two hours before the event. Yeah, that's a really event. good point. We, we do a lot of bridge stuff yeah. too. We, we even set up our own little VoIP PBX. It's quite easy to do these days. And we use that a lot for the live event bridges. And um, that way we can reach, we sort of have the bat phone to site ops and to engineering. We, have, uh, we use Hangouts a lot too for sort of group chat. Although there's so many group chat solutions mm -hmm. now, but I think that's a really good point is have the right staff up and awake and watching the event and, and ready to respond if it's a big event. Yeah, because your on-call may take 20 minutes and that's, that's yeah. even that's yeah. too late. Yeah, there's, there's on-call and then there's watching it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we always watch, when we do a live concert stream, we have people at a nice, quiet, off-site location with good connectivity, but usually residential connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, like a Time Warner cable modem type thing. 
um, watching the event, listening to it, so that they are mirroring what the end user is receiving. And if there's any problems, then they can communicate that up, and we can get it to site ops, and we can say, okay, audio is too low, audio is too high, it's distorting. Um, even stuff like camera iris is blowing out, and it's making the encoding look crappy. So you know, ride your iris, things like that. Interesting. So back, uh, we'll come back to audience questions in a minute, but I got two other ones that I want to um, talk about here. <clears throat> Talking about sort of scalability um, and and the uh, the Pacquiao uh, Hollyfield fight was something that I had actually thought about as part of what I was looking at with questions, what's the threshold for scalability when it comes to authentication and securing content? In other words, in terms of the number of users where you have to authenticate or scale um, security for live events, do we have a threshold in the industry at this point that we're sort of working against? And when you go beyond that, all bets are off. I'm, I'm not the right person. We, our events are smaller scale in the range of 1,000 to 10,000. So we're, we're well within what I consider a, a easily addressable number. Um, now, we might grow beyond that, uh, I hope, in the future. Um, and we, we certainly have plans on the drawing board to do so. But um, I'm sure there will be other bigger names at this table that will hit those event caps before I do. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can only venture a guess is that authentication is not something that's cacheable. So you know, the, the, at least the initial, OK, I am who I say I'm in logging in, there's just no way to, you, tr you truly have, it's a one-to-one -one thing. Mm -hmm. It actually gets a lot easier when you get to the video part. Cause that's <laughs> right. Video. It's right. All, easy. <laughs> it's all cacheable then. So uh, other than that, though, you're right. There's, there's definitely a, an upper limit. And Too many I'm not hits sure. to the authentication server. Yeah, type of thing. there's, there's got to be. And I think maybe sometimes that's overlooked. Mm. I think it's overlooked like like the website. You know, simple yeah. things like, oh, well, authentication works. We've tested it with our six people. Um, <laughs> right. all, the, all the authenticated we stuff. We have redundancy. I've, exactly, yeah. I mean, all the authenticated yeah. stuff I've done has been in the in the enterprise world where they say, here's a list of 5,000 usernames, so you know it's 5,000, you know? Okay, right. Um, in the, I don't, like I said, I don't think in 15 years I've done anything at a large scale that would have required, it was all, external widgets that if they failed, in theory, it, you know, it shouldn't cause any issues. But it was never around authenticating to get to video. The threshold for us would be one, because um, okay. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen, right? So that's the event that just so happens to have the person do some kind of crazy thing. So in we fact, have to I, plan I remember ahead. one of your colleagues a couple years ago, was ta I was talking in London, and he said the day that Michael Jackson died broke the internet, because you all were watching the, it, it just massively scale. Yeah, there's been bombings, there's been events. We just, we don't ever know. Um, we've, we've done our best to, I mean, being a CDN, we can do things a little bit unique, unlike others, in the sense that we run distributed databases, right? So we take the database and we spread it across a bunch of edges. So then we can authenticate and have those redundancies and backups and things like that. I mean, there are price concerns, you know, at what point, but, uh, you know, with this whole cloud, everything virtual, you really don't pay for what you're not using. So as long as you've planned ahead and put things in place and ensured that you have that redundancy, then you can scale appropriately. It's kind of the advantage. When we did load balancing back in the day, it was how many servers can I afford to buy and how many locations. And each location needed a backup for that one. Um, so it doesn't really work the same as it used to. And uh, the ability to, you know, you can't cache everything dynamic, but dynamic caching is coming along, you know, uh, quite a bit, you know. So we can proxy the original website and give it a new C name, and now all of a sudden we're shielding your original website, and we won't let traffic get back to your site. Okay. Um, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of options that you can do, but um, the goal would be plan for the unknown. Um, that's kind of our approach, at least. OK. And then last question, um, if there's any one thing you could tell audience members who are looking to do live events, say, at scale, um, regardless of whether the scale is small scale like you're doing or larger ones, what what do audience members need to know about management and security of the content um, going forward? Because I think this you know, panel of experts who've been through had these failure stories. It, this is the question that you get asked in first grade. You know, what what's the one thing that you did this summer that was the best thing? <laughs> Multiple internet connections. Um, okay. I mean, the single most common is that connection out. It's usually not these load balanced massive infrastructures that are going down. I and mean, if it does, that's a major event. 
it's usually that internet connection. Uh, we recommend products like Zixi with their bonding service or Mushroom Networks. I mean, there's a lot of bonding services out there. Get a bunch of cell phone cards, hook them up. If you're not using them, at least you're not burning the data. Right. And that's your backup plan. We see a lot of sporting events will do that um, because we do so many different kind of the teams travel from place to place. Sure. They want to take not only their satellite dish and all those things, but they'll, they'll take a bunch of Wi-Fi backups. Uh, hotspots in essence. Um, so I'd recommend always having the extra connections out so at least your stream can go somewhere. You know, one CDN goes down, maybe you can point it to another, or something happens, you have at least that. But if your internet goes down, that's it, you're done. I've always forced my teams to do something, uh, and they usually hate it, uh, called follow the frame. And I make them detail every, every touch point that the, the image or the video is going to hit. And then, you know, we simulate. You know, just in Visio, what happens if this fails? Can we reroute? How quickly can we reroute? And then we put our playbooks together based on that. You know, if, if this link fails and we got to go to here, then what should we be doing to get a, a third link back up? Um, and it starts on dry erase board, goes into Visio, and then that becomes the, the key to our playbook. So when you were, what about when you were at AUG where you were using the, um, the location right by the Staples Center? As you said, yeah. that's a you know, fairly redundant. What kind of lessons would you have learned from something like that, even with a a fairly robust solution. You know, we had events where we actually had a DR site. So if earthquake, tsunami, mm -hmm. we're pretty close, close to the ocean, um, that we would have a, typically we wouldn't run active active, but we at least know it would take us 20 minutes and we could fail over to a New York site or okay. Texas or something like that. Got it. Um, but typically budgets wouldn't justify active active. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, if, if you are thinking of streaming, uh, the first thing is, you know, uh, Definitely use a CDN uh, <laughs> if you don't, because <laughs> uh, uh, I think sometimes people think that it's just magic, and so you can have the best stream in the world and a great connection out, but you're going to get hammered if you have more than two people look at the stream. So if you're going to so even it, for Aunt Mildred's wedding, you do <laughs> even for something like that, you'd be surprised. But yeah, that I'd say, and then fine tune that CDN um, because just because you have one in front of something doesn't mean it's going to do what you expect it to do. I, I know that when we were first, you know, doing things with CDNs, um, it ended up, I think, DDoSing us. Actually, I'm not, not looking at you, but uh, you know, it was we had something not set up right, and suddenly we had all this inbound traffic, and it's hammering our uh, central server, and like this, this can't be right, and it's coming from something that should be shielding us from doing that. So um, there's a lot of moving pieces in the cloud, and um, that just. I think it, that takes time. It's not something that you're just going to plug in and it's, it's ready to go. So there's, there's a lot of coordination, no matter big or small event. Um, you just have to, you have to kind of really look at that. And, and not, every, not every event is going to be the same. So in our cycles, we have news cycles. We have breaking, breaking news stories. Um, you kind of have to be able to scale quickly and fast because you never know when Michael Jackson is going to die. Well, <laughs> you know, something like that is, yeah, stay, uh, paying attention to uh, that type of news cycle. Knowing your event is probably the best thing to do. Don't underestimate traffic. Okay. I would, uh, I would echo that the uh, first mile connection is uh, probably one of the most obvious weak points where you see a lot of failures and it's actually there's a lot of choices to, to have redundancy there. So definitely think about that. Um, some of the things that I, I work with a lot of devs that are fairly fresh out of school and young eager guys that, you know, like sort of the, the music that we cover and, you know, I think it's cool that we do rock and roll. So um, we have a, a, sometimes some fairly green programmers in the mix and uh, so I, I have to tell them don't push code before a show. Don't make drastic site changes <laughs> before a show. Yeah. Uh, test everything. Don't think that you're going to be able to hot fix it. Um, and then uh, also, I've been trying to enforce upon them to do sort of like the unplug it test. What happens when you unplug it and you plug it back in? What, what happens? And not just in a physical sense, but in a software sense. If you're calling the Facebook <laughs> API, to do whatever, pull a list of Facebook comments. Um, if you 
block it to where that API doesn't respond, does it break the site? Does it time out after five seconds and, and slow down the load of the page? So exactly. look at all of these components. Like you were saying, draw Visio. We actually haven't done that. That's a really good idea. I should start making them do that. Um, but really do a plug out sort of test. And, and this applies also on the physical equipment. If you momentarily unplug the ethernet connection from the back of the encoder and then plug it back in, does it recover gracefully or does it just sit there until somebody comes over and intervenes manually? So really testing those things. Um, and then take notes of your failure modes because uh, um, that's, that's where you're going to learn. Okay. If you root, don't root cause analysis yeah, after the yeah, fact, exactly. everybody blows it off and they're like, I move on to the next project. Yeah, if yeah. you don't post, do that, do, do a postmortem. Yeah, do a postmortem post for figure sure, out what it was. For sure. And it's funny that you say that about the Ethernet and the power because every appliance that I get in to test for streaming media for review, those are the two tests I do. Yank the mm -hmm. Ethernet, yank the power, yeah. see what happens. Yeah. And it's amazing how many devices won't recover. Right, yeah. So that's. Uh, um, and then I guess to sort of move away from the failure mode thing and, and just on the content, um, you know, it's really, I can't stress enough that having somebody watch the stream from a quiet location is one of the easiest, most valuable pieces of feedback you can get on your own production. So and those people that complain, collect those, because next time have them be your beta testers. If their computer sucks that bad, you know, at least you have a good test bed for the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah uh, definitely. Monitor social media, too. Uh, we've done some events, and just watching what people are saying, good and bad. Uh, it's a lot of fun, actually, watching people watching your stuff, because they're, they're taking pictures of the screen, and, they're, they're, and so the good stuff is in there, but there's the bad stuff, too. They're like, oh, yeah, there's somebody trying to troubleshoot the last mile with somebody in New Zealand or something. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to do, and you can pretty much almost do almost nothing, but they feel like you're paying attention to them at least. So definitely monitor that, because they're kind of like your eyes and ears. You know, one person or, or a couple of people complaining on Twitter can make it look like the whole thing was a disaster, where you might have mm -hmm. thousands of people that were served right. flawlessly, exactly. but if you have three people on there saying, this is a ripoff, they're scam artists, and it's like, come, come on. We're, yes, we do all of this production and set up all of this Just to, to defraud you out of $13. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly what we're about. No, it's, uh, yeah, so we, yeah, monitoring social media, I think, is, yeah. and, and talking to those people. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. All right, probably time for about two questions from the audience. Sir. Um, are you guys doing any content encryption in the submissions where you're actually encrypting the video? And are you talking about content at rest or content in transport or both? In transport live. So live feed, right. are you doing any encryption there? Okay, so the question is encryption for, tra for transport. No. no. No, we're not. We, we encrypt a lot of our satellite content just because it's easy to take down. So especially music, we, we typically encrypt all of that. We run VPN tunnels um, for private streams. Those are really hard to crack and it's really hard to get around. And uh, so very um, risky things you don't want on the internet, such as live surgeries. Right? So doctors are watching at different facilities. And that's not something you're going to stream, per se, over public net. And they might not have the, the connectivity. So we run tunnels for them, uh, a lot of VPN encryption, um, unique things like that. So it depends on how you define encryption. Uh, there's a ton of ways to encrypt it, but it, you know, if your encryption is wonderful, well, none of your clients necessarily are going to have that decryption capability. You know, you've got to work with the, the tools available, and you don't want to affect the stream. Encryption means more data, more content, more cost. Um, you know, when you go to an SSL page, it takes longer to load because it's all encrypted. If you do that to a stream where every single photo and the audio is all encrypted, you can just imagine you've driven your cost pretty significant. So you have to have a very good reason to do that. And uh, so I'd recommend something like uh, you know, VPNs and tunneling and, and unique options like that before I would go full on encryption. So for the doctors, the, the, what you're describing there is part of that you're having to do it for HIPAA laws or you're just having to do it because? Yeah, I mean, there, there's some HIPAA requirements to be okay. met. Um, but also, we just don't want somebody's surgery to be seen online. Sure. Even sure. though that person said, I'm fine with it. You know, it's, what if the doctor messes up? Great. Right. Now, this doctor just botched a surgery, and everybody's going to call him out on it. Right. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reasons why we'll run specialized streaming. And uh, once you get them inside of these tunnels, it's, it's really tough. To, I mean, even a hacker is going to have a hard time. And by the time they get in, the stream's over. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when you go to your, your Starbucks and you connect to that open Wi-Fi, 
it's pretty easy to hack somebody. The second you flip on a tunnel, well, you know, they're going to go after something a lot easier before you. OK, got it. One last question. Depends on how can, you set up VPNs. Can uh, you re repeat the question so that we can get that for the stream? Depends on the CDN, right? Uh, it depends on the CDN. If you're using virtualized services, Amazon, Linode, DigitalOcean, you can spin them up on the fly. Um, our backbone has that capability. And I know of another, a number of other providers that have options like that. It's not always called VPN. There's, there's other terms around it, it's depending on the protocol and how you're doing those tunnels. But those private tunnels are available. just depends on the CDN that you're going through. Great. All right, I'd like to ask the audience to uh, join me in thanking our panelists for being on the panel.